make yourselves comfortable. Um, my name's Graeme McKenzie. I'm the Chief Executive Officer at the City of Fremantle. Um, and I'm just going to give you a very brief, short introduction to, for the important things. Um, the public conveniences are out that door and, and down the, out the back. Uh, you'll see the signs, they're quite clearly marked. Uh, if there is, happens to be some sort of emergency, the emergency exits uh, both those two doors and there's a further emergency exit over on the right hand side of the building there. Uh, and the other thing I do need to let you know right up front um, is that this event is being filmed. Uh, in fact, the whole, the whole process and series of workshops will be filmed uh, and there will be some photography as well. So um, if anybody objects to any of that, um, you need to let um, the photographer know at the time. This is a public hall and, and uh, we're actually quite excited about documenting this process over the, over the journey. Um, my job now, just briefly, we're here. We're here for a couple of reasons, but primarily we want to have a really, at the city, we, we want to have a, a broad based um, discussion with the community about the things that are really important uh, and about the things that will be important to your grandchildren. I think that's a, a pretty good uh, message if you can keep that in mind when you're thinking about some of these issues. Tonight will be an engaging night. We're not going to stand here and talk at you the whole time. Um, you've probably found pieces of paper on your chairs um, and they'll come into play a bit later on. We've got some really good speakers for you, some really short, sharp speakers to challenge some of your thinking. Um, but before we get that underway, um, do, can I introduce to you uh, Mr Len Collard, a very good friend of the city of Fremantle and the Fremantle community uh, and a, a Noongar elder to give us a welcome to country. Len. Thanks, Graeme, uh, for those lovely words. Uh, good to see a lot of uh, people here this evening, and uh, just want to say uh, that ngan kur tuk tuk ning jen ning kumba ma men yoga ya kuling ya walwani ya pujra yai. Nono kada karijen budawan ngan jen ning wingi wa wabling Fremantle City Council. Nien ngan budi ngan kada kur kuling. Yan Yunga Karich Wanga Windy Wa. So, uh, what I was really talking about was the Fremantle Visions and about people looking ahead to see where we we're going to go and what path we were going to pursue. So, I just wanted to remind you about what we're here for tonight. Uh, too many distinguished uh, men and women here tonight to uh, uh, point out. And, of course, it's a bit bright out the front. I can't actually see who you good people are. But, of course, uh, without going to say, Graeme, uh, thanks for those kind words. And, of course, Bradley, he's always uh, seems to be at the front, being the mayor, I suppose. That's what happens when you're the mayor. You get to have a say. But um, I, uh, with the Welcome to Country, uh, it's, it's a, an event which I think Fremantle Council prides itself on, and it's always on the agenda. And uh, um, it's part of the old culture of Fremantle. And um, just to remind you that uh, it, is, it is probably one of the oldest cultural phenomena uh, in, in Australian public ceremony, the Welcome to Country, always carried out by uh, traditional owners, basically uh, to uh, tell people that it's a safe place to be, that we acknowledge it here, and uh, we're looking forward to catch up and have a chat with you. Keeping in mind, I know it's really busy, and Vita's written out the rules to me, and said, Len, keep it short, because we know those Aboriginal stories can go on and on and on. And of course, uh, never want to upset Vita. I always uh, say, yeah, Vita. What do you say, Vita? So uh, I've got a little stone in my pocket. And uh, Brad, if you um, would uh, pop up this way, because I know you're going to probably be the next, next speaker, one of the next speakers. And um, I think we can talk footy in Fremantle, because the docks are doing well. <laughs> and uh, of course, uh, I've got a little uh, magic stone here, and it's a little dog on it, because uh, obviously the home of the bulldogs. Of course, the sharks, I'm sure, have got something to say about that. Um, on the other side, the uh, on, on the other side of Frio. But Brad, here's a little dog. Here's a little dog there. And of course, just to remind people about the Dreamtime dog, 
here in, uh, in Wailing up in the dream time when the wild ruler uh, set it all up. He said to the dog that the dog, you've got to guard the mouth of the river. And of course, we know the big red dog um, symbolically represents that uh, spiritual phenomena, uh, prominently uh, over um, on the north side of the river looking out to sea. The dog also manifests itself as an icon of the football club, the South Mountain Footy Club. And also, as we get around the traps, we see more dogs' uh, icons popping up around the traps. And that's not by some uh, uh, quirk of nature. That's part of the spiritual uh, phenomena that lives in this country. It's the dog story. So I'm going to finish on that note by playing a little tune on the didgeridoo. And one of my old, uh, one of my, uh, old professors uh, down at Cuss there, Peter Newman, I saw Peter. Where is he? Where's Peter? There he is. Where is he? Oh, he's over there. Uh, Peter, I, I thought I'd bring in the, uh, the new dig. <laughs> Prominently marked with the uh, colours of free now. <laughs> and, um, so I thought I'd come and show it off tonight and uh, I, knew, I know Peter would be very uh, envious and jealous because he's got a beauty over there at Cusp. <laughs> Thanks, Len, for your warm, as always, welcome to country. It's, it, it's absolutely fantastic and I uh, really appreciate you coming down. And welcome to you all. What a great turnout. It's fantastic to see you all here for the launch of Fremantle 2029, our community visioning project. I'm not going to talk much tonight. I've got the, the job of introducing our range of very good speakers and to uh, really get you engaged. And as the first little thing is those coloured bits of paper, that are on your um, seats. You just have to not use them yet, okay? We'll, we'll tell you when to use them. So no writing on them yet. But um, for those of you who've already filled them out, uh, well, there's not much you can do. But I'm but, um, just, just asking you to hold your horses on that one. This, aha, uh -huh, here's my magic tool. Okay, so this is the launch. This is the kickoff of what is going to be a conversation that we're going to be having with all of you over the next 12 to 18 months um, around what we want and plan to make Fremantle look like in 2029 and beyond. As Graham said, this is about not just what we want for Freo, but it's about what our kids want and what our grandkids want and what our great grandkids want. It's about really thinking about some of those big decisions that Fremantle has to make. It's going to be an interactive process, it's going to be fun, and it's going to be one we hope that you enjoy being engaged and involved in. Um, so well, one of the things we want to do, we're trying out um, Twitter tonight. So the details are in the top right hand corner there for those of you who have smartphones um, and would like to start following the process on, on, on Twitter, please um, get those, you're welcome to get those out and, um, and actually become part of that and that will be an ongoing conversation that we're having with you using that medium and a range of others um, as, as Graham said Linda's filming and it's going to be quite a I think a creative and interactive process and tonight we're kicking it off with some fantastic speakers um, we've got Ken Michael who I'll in, in, introduce in, in, in a second um, Sonny Crooks and Fred Elton are from Lance Holt School and um, they're going to be talking they're 12 and they're going to be talking about what they want Fred to look like when they're 28 um, Dr. Julian Bolliter, who's written an amazing book called Made in Australia, is going to be talking about some broader context for us around the future of Australian cities. Vanessa Rowland, who's a local, lives, lives in, in the heart of Frio, about sustain, a, a sustainable and livable Fremantle. And finally, Griff Longley, who'll be well known to all of you around actually how do we make Fremantle a place for people. I think you all agree that it's a pretty exciting list of speakers and all going to be really short and sharp, because that's, and, and we're going to make sure that we do some interactive stuff in between each of those. Um, 
as I said, there's going to be lots of range of medium, look, looking from Facebook to Vimeo to Twitter and on the web so that you can, we can keep engaged on this. There'll be regular public forums like this for you to get together, meet people and engage, but also in between time using social media to do it will be a really important part. 2029. Um, Freo's been here for a long, long time and seeing Lynn up there playing the did, realising that Freo is a meeting place for Indigenous people for tens of thousands of years. But 2029 is a significant date because it was when Captain Fremantle, up somewhere near the Roundhouse, in fact I've just been reading a history of Freo, which is debates as to where the flag was actually planted, but it was somewhere near the Roundhouse, planted his flag in, 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 in 2029. It was also so I say, yeah, 1829 would be more accurate, that's right. <laughs> so just checking that you're all listening. Yeah. Didn't quite sound right. But interestingly, um, 100 years after that was actually when Freo became a city in, 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 in 1929. In fact, so, so we've sort of been a town and, and we actually became a city in our own right in, in 1929. And then one, it's actually 180 years ago, and this, has anyone ever noticed this? I must say, I lived in Freo, I reckon, for 20 years before I, I noticed this. I think it might have actually been Peter Newman who pointed it out to me. Um, and it's, it's under the town hall. So next time you walk, under the, walk by the town hall, there's this plaque in the ground, and it's fascinating. So it was, it's a, um, what it does is it points out and commemorates the first plan for Fremantle. And that first plan was made 180 years ago, in 1833, when Freo was a bunch of tents and the roundhouse, um, and not much else. And, and, but they actually, if you look at it, you, actually, you can see this, the place we live in today that is actually mapped out there. It's amazing. And so actually is that real sense of that planning happened back then, and that plan and that vision 180 years ago is actually the foundations of what we love about Freo today. So I kind of think of us to, today as actually kind of continuing that process of a changing and evolving Freo. And just using the town hall as an example, when it was built in 1888, kind of sat there by itself, and then... Um, Later on, it was built up all around it. In the 1950s, you can see King Square is barely recognisable. In fact, uh, there's certainly, certainly no Maya building and a whole bunch of shops behind the town hall. And then by the 1970s, a lot of those had gone and the car had somehow started to dominate the public spaces and we had a, um, a, a town hall that was a car park and, a, again, a very evolving Frio. And then more recently, well, it kind of looks like that, minus the Maya signs now, and, which, and we, we, this will again be evolving pretty rapidly into a building that look, might look something like that. This is the final plan, plans are yet to be finalised, but, but you get the picture. And Freo is changing and it is evolving. And I'm excited about it. This, what you'll hear today from our speakers is there are some huge challenges in, in front of us, but that's what's exciting about how we deal with those and how we make Fremantle an even more livable space 10, 20, 50, 180 years into the future. This is actually from Julian's book, and Julian will be one of our speakers tonight. And I, I just stole this quote out of it because I thought it was quite powerful. The future just doesn't happen. It is shaped by vision and by discourse, which, which then translates into what we build. What we build this century will make or break our country and, I would add, our community. So that's why we're here tonight. With that, I'm going to kick off by introducing our very first speaker. I'm very proud and it was a real privilege to have Ken Michael here. Dr Ken Michael was the Governor of Western Australia from 2006 to 2011 and his previous appointments include Chancellor of the University of WA, Chairman of the East Perth Redevelopment Authority, Chairman of the West Australian Museum and Member of the Economic Re Regulation Authority. Dr Michael has worked in many fields including public service, engineering, academia and was named West, the West Australian Citizen of the Year in 2001 in the category of, of professions. He continues his support of the community in his retired capacity, including chairing a working group of the Committee for Perth, which was called Toward a Bright Future, a vision for Perth as a region of 3.5 million people. I'd like to welcome to the stage, Dr Michael. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mayor Pettit, and to all of you. Um, it's great to see such a number here this evening, and my role tonight is 
just to perhaps give you an account of some of my background in the planning perspective and some of the issues and challenges that you face along the journey. And I guess I've had a fairly long period at trying this. And there's no real formula, but perhaps just giving you some understanding of the experiences I've had may, may just throw some light on some of the issues and, and certainly, um, hopefully, will add to the debate this evening. But to Dr Brad Bennett, uh, Mayor of the City of Fremantle, to Graham McKenzie, the Chief Executive Officer, to James Best, who will be our facilitator this evening, to all of you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, could I also begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land where we are gathered this evening and pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Now, we're looking at Fremantle and we see this beautiful coastal port city bounded by the Indian Ocean and the Swan River, short distance away from Perth, established in 1829, as we all know, as a port for the colony and was the major city in Western Australia for much of its early history. And Fremantle is unique. I, like all of you, have fond memories of Fremantle, in my case, from the time I was a child to this very day. We all enjoy Fremantle, its rich heritage, its community engaging activities, enjoy it as a cultural centre and an active commercial city. And in case I reflected back immediately, as I was telling the Mayor the other day, as a teenager, some X years ago, I should say, but it's actually it was 60 years ago. Um, and I, as, a, as, a, as a son of Greek migrants, I used to come down as a 14-year-old with my mother, who was uh, sponsoring particular new migrants, and I was given the task of translating. So I was an interpreter at a very young age. I hope I got the right message across. I'll probably never know, but they, they still settled down very comfortably here, enjoyed it all, and their names... Uh, are enshrined on the welcome walls uh, at the Maritime Museum, which was put down many years later. Fremantle's unique character is captured by its landscape, its heritage, its architecture, its music, its arts, culture, festivals, its retail stores, markets, cafes, and the list goes on. It's a popular des destination for local and international visitors. What will Fremantle be like in 2029 and beyond, which is the question we're all asking this evening. I think the main message is each of you will have an opportunity to take part to say what can shape or what can be done to shape Fremantle's future. The city of Fremantle has the vision of Fremantle to be recognised as a unique city of cultural and economic significance, and I believe that would still stand but it also has some key strategic uh, imperatives which relate to the economic development, urban renewal, climate change and environmental protection, issues that we are all very familiar with, transport, character, community and safety and of course capability. And you put all these together and you have in, in essence the direction the city is currently taking. And with that on the table and with its strategic plan which exists to the year, I think, 2015, I believe it's a very good starting point uh, to have a, a look at what should or could happen to the city of Fremantle as we go uh, forward in this century. But what does lie beyond? What fr will Fremantle be like in 2029 and beyond? Much of it should be what you would like to see. Your involvement is critical to make it all happen. It is all about the journey we all see ahead and the need to be part of it. And while we continue to enjoy what Fremantle represents, it is an opportune time to reflect on its future as we approach its bicentenary in 2029. Acknowledging past and present initiatives, now is the time to bring all our collective thoughts and ideas together in an integrated way to bring all our uh, ideas to provide the basis on which Fremantle can become the vibrant and livable place we and future generations can all enjoy. We need to work together to develop a long-term shared vision and to be proactive in producing the best result for everyone. A tall ask? Yes, but doing nothing is not the answer. This timing presents a golden opportunity to look well ahead and put in place a planning framework 
that will deliver the very best for Fremantle, its community, and indeed the wider community. My background in planning extends over a number of years. In Main Roads, as a member of the Planning Commission, and more recently, as Brad mentioned, Chairman of the Steering Committee for the Committee for Perth's Project Towards a Bright Future, which was launched last year. And this reflected on growth, and growth brings challenges, such as through traffic congestion, overcrowded public transport, housing and rental affordability, and urban sprawl. The Committee for Perth report looked at creating a vision for the metropolitan area under the six headings of the people, prosper, plan, green, learn and create, and decide. Aspects which provided the participants a, a, a clear focus on what could be added to the debate. And just as an aside of the 20 recommendations made within this uh, report, the highest priority needed to be given to creating a shared vision that community could help drive, creating a fully integrated public transport network, reforming local government and governance, and tackling housing affordability, all elements to which I'm sure you can relate. We need to make sure that we are creating an environment where people will want to live, to do business, to visit, and to enjoy. And Fremantle is unique, with its heritage reflected in its architecture and setting, its energy and its vibrancy, and its family feel in its community. Looking to the future, judgments need to be made as to how much of the present should be preserved, and how new initiatives enhancing the current areas of choice, as well as new ones, to activate, activate Fremantle and to take it forward to the next century. To its next century, I should add. Like any effective plan, it needs to be supported by a shared vision and by the community in developing that vision and establishing the path of the journey to get there. If this is what you would like to see, then you need to be part of that journey. Planning plays such an integral part in making things happen in a holistic sense. And this does make a difference. This involves many groups and there are many levels of planning. The coordination of such activities and the willingness to work together can only lead to better results for the community as a whole. You only need to see the benefit of doing so by reflecting on two visionaries that have inspired me from the very beginning of my engineering career some 50 years ago. And I refer to C.Y. O'Connor and architect Gordon Stevenson. When I reflect on the work of engineer C.Y. O'Connor, I can only be impressed with his broad knowledge and attention to detail in, in achieving significant results, be it in the Fremantle Harbour or the Goldfields Pipeline or the railway network or any of his other achievements. He understood the requirements. He was sensitive to the environment. He cared for people. He explored the technical options and he evaluated what was required based on good information. His legacy and his connection with Fremantle remain to this day. On another front, a planning scheme did not exist for metropolitan region, Perth and Fremantle as it was called. And in 1953, Professor Gordon Stevenson of the University of Liverpool was commissioned by the government to prepare a plan for the region with a population at that time of 420,000 people. Alistair Hepburn, the then newly appointed Town Planning Commission, was closely associated with Professor Stevenson in the preparation of a plan which was, which was to be prepared for its growth over the next 50 years. The result was the 1955 Stevenson-Hepburn report, including proposals at both regional and district levels. In fact, the report's target of 1.4 million people at the end of the last century was a figure very close to the actual population at the time. And then, in 1963, the Metropolitan Regional Planning Authority was established and has continued to guide us since then, although now known, now known as the Western Australian Planning Commission. And now the government is seeking to look ahead again towards 2031 and beyond. So the it's very timely to be doing the very thing that we're talking about. But we need to work together to develop a long-term vision to guide us in this way. 
If we don't start working towards a shared vision now, our options in the not too distant future will be reactive rather than proactive and that will not produce the best result for any of us. At a planning congress in 1968, Professor Stevenson remarked, and I quote, in the planning process, a plan should const be constantly under review. It should be dynamic, constantly generating interest, and if it is to be effective, every detail should be related to the whole. Stevenson was reminding us that plans are dynamic, subject to review along the way, but given that the overarching vision and accompanying plan in respect of land use have been developed in a considered way, any changes would reflect this consistency and you can move forward with some confidence. Fremantle should be examined not only from the local or regional perspective. It needs to be considered within the global and visitors alike. With the changing technologies faced today, communication is faster, more effective, and will provide interaction with others well beyond our imagination. If this appeals, how can it be translated into action? All levels of government clearly have a role. Planners and like professionals have a role. Importantly, you as community members have a significant role. Getting involved is fundamental if you would like to see the type of Fremantle you and your children would like to enjoy. You are closest to what the needs are. It is an opportunity to select those areas which should remain and be enhanced, to create new precincts of development that will appeal to others to become part of the community, create activity hubs that will uh, generate business and commercial opportunities, create areas of leisure and family enjoyment, to improve transport and accessibility, and to create a lifestyle that perhaps maintains and even enhances the style you have today. It is an opportune time to have input on whether there should be more of the same, perhaps enhanced in some way, or create new vibrant areas that reflect the changing world as it emerges. When you become engaged in these situations, keep an open mind, shift from your traditional position, seize the opportunity to create new areas of involvement or use the opportunity to expand on these activities and areas that are successful. Engaging with, with each other is critical in this respect if you wish to make a difference. This does not mean making changes for changes sake. Reflecting on the past and the present is always a good starting point to evaluate what works and what is best to take forward. I often refer to a quote by Winston Churchill in these circumstances. And he said, and I quote, the farther backward you can look, the farther forward you are likely to see. This does not mean you entrench yourself in the past, but to re review what is good and take the idea forward with you if it has merit. One of the special elements that appeals to me is the heritage value of Fremantle. Reminding us of our history, as Fremantle's does, is quite a leveller for me. It reminds us of our beginnings, the rich indigenous history and culture, European settlement and its impact, developments in the direction that Western Australia has taken as a whole and reminds us of our principles and values that make up who we are. We do not want to lose this, but there, are, there may be other ways in which this can be explored or enhanced and starting the conversation initiates the way forward. You as community members are key to the journey. I think it goes without saying that we all love Fremantle. We do want to retain this appeal, but recognising that change is inevitable, how do we go forward responding to modern trends, modern demands, reflecting on what the future may bring, yet maintaining this inherent appeal? The city of Fremantle is the custodian of this appeal and takes care of it, but it too needs to seek opportunities. How can we create new initiatives approaching the bicentenary while maintaining the culture and appeal that Fremantle represents. This milestone, that is 2029, is a great catalyst and an opportune one to do just this. Thinking beyond this time frame will facilitate a vibrant and livable and sustainable Fremantle. Options need to be kept open, 
while addressing future needs. What would you do as community members and what would you like to see for Fremantle at the end of its 200 years? A shared vision is, excuse me, a shared vision is needed, perhaps looking beyond this period, say 50 years, so that Fremantle, the Fremantle you will see in 2029 will have all the elements you would like to see without compromising the future and will form a solid basis for the next 100 years. So as community members, I urge you to be part of the journey and realise the Fremantle you would all like to see under the guiding hand of the city of Fremantle. And it is fitting, as I draw this to a close, to reflect on some words in the Stevenson Hepburn report of 1955. In a forward to the report, the then, and happened to be the first Minister for Planning, the Honourable Gil Gilbert Fraser, MLC, noted, and I quote, the need, and remembering this is in 55, the need for an overall plan for the metropolitan region of Perth and Fremantle has been apparent for most thinking people for many years. These two cities, one the state capital and one the principal seaport and the western gateway to the state, have grown at a surprising rate since the first settlement took place. And it seems clear that expansion will go forward. They now, now form part of a large metropolis on both sides of the Swan River and it is important to all of us that the metropolis grows in a way of which we can be proud. The essence of those words is reflected today for different reasons perhaps, but with the same purpose, to begin a new journey and to do so with pride. And in doing so, can I wish you all every success as you venture towards 2029 as the first stop on this journey. Thank you and all the very best to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. It, we really do appreciate your presence in launching this really important process. And, uh, and your words. In the next stage, we're going to have five different speakers who are going to give us some short, less than five minute snippets on their, their visions for Fremantle. And we're going to start with Sonny and Fred, if you guys want to come up. Sonny and Fred are from Lance Holt, which is a school right in the West End, in the heart of the West End of, of, of Fremantle. And um, in fact, I learned when I met with these guys the other day that Sonny. Um, has spent her whole life living in the house next, well, just two doors down from the roundhouse, which is pretty extraordinary. And Fred has li li lives in, in North Fremantle. And they've been talking about, when I'm 28, what I'd like Fremantle to be known for. Thanks so much for being part of this. Cheers. Hi, I'm Sunny Crooks, and this is Fred Elton. Fred and I are Year 7s at Lanthorpe School in the West End of Fremantle. We are here to offer our opinions on the future of Fremantle from a kid's perspective. Our, we have been talking to our friends, family and fellow students about what they think Fremantle should be like in 2029. Our ideas will be focusing on beaches and parks because we believe that they are, most, they are the most used places and apartments near the beach that are low cost so more residents can afford to live there. Um, more cafes, so hopefully that'll bring more people to Fremantle. Uh, a saltwater pool like the one at, in Bondi in Sydney. And my big idea is to develop a naturescape playground near the beach that brings schools and families to Fremantle. What I will include in the naturescape is logs to climb on, rope ladders and climbing frames, water play like streams and waterfalls, cubby spaces and nature activities. Hello, my name is Fred Elton and I'm going to say a few things about what I believe Fremantle should be like in 2029. 
Fremantle is already a great place for everyone, not least kids, but there are still improvements to be made. Like Sunny said, the beaches and the parks are great places for everyone and are important to the Fremantle lifestyle. Some ideas I thought of were more playing equipment at beaches and in local parks, such as Gilbert Fraser Park in North Fremantle and the Esplanade. Beach accessibility, including ramps for the disabled children and adults and senior citizens. It would be great to have bikes of all sizes to hire to ride between beaches, parks, cafes and shops, such as kids' bikes, tandem bikes and tricycles. I also think it would be a great idea to, put, to build a new bridge across the Swan River and make the old bridge a pedestrian walkway. <laughs> Thank you for listening to our ideas. And as a question, what do you think can be achieved in Fremantle by 2029 so that when I am 28, I will want to live in Fremantle? Okay, that was your cue for your first interactive Part. Now, that on the colour, sorry, just to get to my right page here. So on the blue one in front of you, we would like you to answer the question that Fred put to you and is also on the screen. What's the one thing that you would like for Fremantle to be known for in 2029? Dr Julian Bolito, who's going to be our next presenter, um, I saw him present recently, and it's a really exciting presentation based on a new book that he's done, which is called Made in Australia, which looks at an Australian population of 62 million, which he wrote with Richard Weller. Julian is an awarded landscape architect with over 10 years professional experience working in with landscape architectural firms around the world. And he recently completed a PhD on landscape architecture in Dubai. And Julian, very great to have you here. Please come to the stage. Okay. Uh, firstly, I'm from the Australian Urban Design Research Centre. We're a research centre of UWA and we're affiliated with the Department of Planning, none of who should be home, uh, held accountable for what I say tonight. Um, we're asking you to, and inviting you to consider a broader context to Fremantle's growth. That context is firstly a national context and secondly a regional context. So, firstly to the national context. The Australian Bureau of Statistics predicts uh, two sets of population statistics for this century. That is that by mid-century, our national population will more or less double, and by the end of the century, it will more or less triple. It should be pointed out, this is the highest projections that the ABS, the Bureau of Statistics, give us, but we feel they should be taken seriously, and that we should work to the highest projections, because we can always backtrack from that point. Um, so basically, the 2100 figure is, applies to the whole nation of 62 million people, and the mid-century projection of 42 million, they also break down into projections for the cities. And they project a Perth of about 4.2 million. So we're roughly increasing two and a half times in the next 40 years. So this means it's taken us 200 years to build what we have. Essentially, we need to build that over again two and a half times in the next 40 years, which in itself is a formidable challenge. However, we now have to do that within the constraints of diminishing resources. We're going to run out of oil in about 42 years. We're running out of steel. Uh, we're going to, even uranium is going to be expended in the next 90 years or so. So we have to do this enormous city building exercise in a period where we're going to be quite constrained. We also can't emit carbon as we have in the past, so there's an additional constraint there. It's a formidable challenge. When we look to the existing planning as to how this has been planned for, we must turn to the capital city plans, which exist for all the uh, major cities of Australia. We don't have a federally coordinated plan for this growth. It occurs city by city. And our planning is, at a really simplistic level, mostly defined by our infill targets and our greenfield targets. Infill targets means urban development within the existing growth boundary, and greenfield targets, which refers to development which is outside the existing city, essentially a suburbia. And when we take a quick look around the nation at all the capital city plans, we find they average about 60%. So we're trying to achieve 60% infill development. 
Perth has a fairly um, unambitious target of 47%, the lowest in the nation for infill development. So, we just thought, just to visualise that kind of growth for you, we would project forward to 2050, to that population of 4.2 million, as to what implications that will have for our city if we stick to the existing policy settings of 47% infill development and 53% greenfield. So this is what the government is saying. All we're doing is taking the government figures and running them out to mid-century. And it means this. We will need to build 480 square kilometres of suburban fabric in the next 40 years, which is accurately scaled there on the left. So you can see that hovering over, over Perth. It's a substantial amount of suburban fabric. We will build according to the policy settings. So we need to build 618 new thousand new suburban houses and according to the policy we need to build 576,000 apartments which will go in principally into activity centres which is densification around transport nodes. So the real issue is this, I mean to date suburban fabric has served us pretty well uh, but in a context when we're going to run out of oil, we're not going to be able to drive private vehicles around to get to these suburban houses, we have a real issue. We have a greater issue too which is that Perth sits within a biodiversity hotspot. Even though we look at the, the vegetation of the Swan Coastal Plain, it doesn't look very biodiverse. It doesn't look like the Amazon. It, it, it really just looks like scrubland. But in fact, it's one of a very biodiverse um, regions in the world. It's what's called a biodiversity hotspot. Uh, biodiversity hotspots are characterised by the fact they have 50% of the world's plant species in them, and they're under serious threat. They've already been cleared to an extent of about 70%. So this additional 480 square kilometres of suburban development will likely be built on the Swan Coastal Plain. And we're yet to be able to reconcile suburban development with this very biodiverse and very fragile landscape. And that this is the issue. That's if we do meet our infill targets, but we're not presently. Presently, although across the nation we're trying to achieve 60% infill, we're only really doing about 30% at the moment. So even though we talk about building an additional 480 square kilometres of suburban fabric, if we continue not to meet our infill targets, that's going to be substantially more. And we could consider that Perth could be renamed at Girth, and then we'll be looking at this kind of nightmare scenario where Perth could extend to Lancelin in the north and mile up in the south. And as I've said, it's not a very resilient form. When you're going into a century where you're going to be experiencing the effects of climate change and diminishing resources, this is not the kind of suburban form you want to be stuck with. The other issue is that a lot of you will be saying, well, yeah, we don't like that, but, geez, the infill development we've seen isn't very good either. And, look, I can totally concur with you, and I empathise with that. Uh, I empathise with it because this is me standing on the roof of my house in Bayswater. So I'm living in this stuff, and it's not pleasant. Um, small blocks, big houses, residual space around the house, which really doesn't provide much in terms of amenity. But... It also doesn't provide much in terms of ecosystem services. Historically, our gardens, they sequestered carbon, they grew food, they dealt with stormwater, they provided for recreation. And there was a kind of uh, peacefulness that comes about with interaction with nature and vegetation, which you lose in this sitting where you're staring out your bedroom window at a fence. Um, so we've tried to give them some names to bring them to life there, but they're typically low amenity. They're unsustainable. The houses are not shrouded by vegetation, which reduces the heat, heating and cooling loads. Um, and they offer little to existing communities. The existing community doesn't benefit from this kind of infill development. And so I, I could hardly agree with people who, who, who feel opposed to this kind of thing. So the question for today is, and I'm not the person to answer this, but we had a quick go, is what could Fremantle's role be in solving this dilemma? And I, I'm going to nail my colours to the mast here. I do think Frio should be a... a, a and we do. We think Fremantle should be a, a node of density. And for the following reasons. It has significant cultural amenity. I mean, Frio has a great kind of character and it's got a great life about it, it's got a great energy about it. And we feel that that's the kind of thing that we should be building upon. It's got greater natural amenity, so access to the rivers and the coasts. So the idea here is fundamentally, we believe, for doing density well in this century, it's going to be about doing density where we do have amenity. It's not. When you create density where you don't have amenity, you look at creating a ghetto-like situation. You need to build on your strengths when it comes to consolidating cities. It's about connectivity. We have access to great public transport in Fremantle. The idea that we should be putting people where they have access to connectivity, to transport. It's about employment. You want to put people where they can work. And it's got good bones. 
uh, we can all acknowledge that the structure of free metal is very resilient, and it's the kind of structure we feel you can graft density onto. And it has great character, and we don't see that character and heritage and urban infill development and growth are mutually exclusive. We believe if it's handled properly, these, the act of infilling the city can actually build on the kind of character and the heritage that we have. And I wanted to just make a point, this is not the kind of density we're talking about. Um, unfortunately, we have a legacy of quite bad, dense, high density development from the 1970s, and it has to be, we have to make a distinction here. This is not the kind of density we're talking about. This offers very little to an existing community, and it actually offers very little to the people living in it too, apart from the fact that it can be affordable. This is what, more like what we're talking about. This is density as you might experience it in 2013. A couple of projects here from around Australia which are sustainable. It's about putting people where transport is. They're well adapted in terms of the climate and they're done with efficient building techniques. Uh, they're livable. It's about having very high quality upgraded public open space around these developments which acts as an incentive for a local community to accept them. They're affordable. So it's about having a diversity of people who can afford to live in your neighbourhood. It's also about for you when you want to age in place and you don't want to have to move out of your neighbourhood. There's options there. So there's a diversity of housing stock. And they're integrated. You don't just plonk these things into the suburbs. They're integrated into suburban fabric. They're built on transport corridors. They're built in a way that they blend into the suburb. They're not just plonked in. So enough generalities. This argument is fairly well established, I guess, where I've been to so far. But we would like to actually land this in Frio and just visualise a scenario of how Frio could grow into the future. And I'm going to step back a little bit from this. This was done by a student of ours, an excellent student, Dinesh Candius, who posed the question, first initially posed the statement, and he said, we're not necessarily saying Fremantle port should go. That's not for us to say. We're not economists. We don't understand the mechanics of ports. And that's hard to predict. However, he did say, but if it did go, what would the site's potential be? And we've had a quick go at visualising it. So this is an image of Fremantle could look like by 2056 from a helicopter floating off the coast. The development of the port in a way that's potentially livable. You have many people potentially living at quite high density here with great access to the beaches, great access to the river and to the cultural amenity of Fremantle. It's potentially sustainable. They're living near transport. Uh, they're living, living near where there could be wave energy, wind energy. And it could be designed from the ground up around the principles of sustainability. And it could contain about 55,000 dwellings or about 100,000 people, which could do th two things. One, it takes the pressure off other areas of Fremantle to develop at significant density. But even more significantly, it potentially saves about 34 square kilometres of the Swan Coastal Plain heathland that we've talked about, which is often forgotten, which is on the edge of the city, which is part of one of these only 21 biodiversity hotspots in the world. So the question I would pose to you today is what is Fremantle's role in accommodating an additional 2.5 million people in the region by 2056? which is what the Australian Bureau of Statistics have projected. It's not something we've dreamt up in a way that is both sustainable and livable. Thank you. Right. OK, thanks for um, giving me the opportunity to speak tonight, Brad. Um, I'm obviously coming from a sustainability perspective. Um, so to frame my vision, um, we're obviously facing some really serious issues around climate change at the moment. Uh, we reached a really significant milestone last week um, where we passed 400 um, parts per million, or ppm, um, of carbon dioxide. But that's the concentration within our atmosphere. That's a very significant threshold. It's the first time uh, in three, 3 million years that we've reached that. And scientists globally have been saying that we should be stabilising around 350. So we're really entering new territory here. Um, and Fremantle is um, going to be, uh, well, this poses significant challenges um, for Fremantle in terms of mitigation and adaptation. Um, for adaptation, an example is our West End is, is currently only about, uh, not, not currently, it is only uh, 90 centimetres above sea level, so it's very vulnerable to sea level rise. And in terms of mitigation, obviously carbon, carbon reduction is a big priority for the council as it is for the nation. Um, and we do have a big challenge ahead of us. We, we currently have one of the highest per capita carbon footprints in the world of um, around 25 tonnes per person. Um, and Western Australia has one of the highest within Australia. And this is largely because of our, the design of our cities, which is based around, uh, I guess, low density sprawled suburbs, which is very um, resource and carbon intensive and obviously very car dependent as well. 
And, and when we compare our footprint to, to cities around the world, you can um, really see uh, places, I mean, these are all very big cities and they have a much smaller carbon footprint than, than we do. New York's an example there of around seven tonnes per person compared to our 25. So, uh, and then this is largely because of, of density and, and the um, opportunities that, that density enables in terms of low carbon infrastructure and uh, trans public transport is one uh, example of that. And this, this graph is showing the correlation between density and, car uh, and transport energy. So um, density is along the, the bottom and as you can see as density increases um, transport energy which then obviously uh, relates to, to greenhouse gas emissions uh, decreases sharply. And there's a lot of other uh, low carbon infrastructure that also requires density. So my vision um, for Frio in 2029 is that it's going to be a, a low carbon, transit oriented, sustainable, vibrant and bustling city. Um, and so that means there's going to be many, many more people and uh, much more activity happening. And it's, although it sounds counterintuitive, all those things really do um, reinforce each other. Um, and they go hand in hand. So just to quickly um, go through what that, what that really means. Um, so first and foremost, Frio will be a transit, um, trans, uh, sorry, a city based around low carbon and uh, carbon-free transport modes. We're really fortunate to have a train station at the heart of our city, which puts us in a fantastic starting position. Um, in, in 2029, we'll, we've reintroduced, reintroduced the tram, which ironically is what our city was based around when we designed it. Um, we'll be giving much more uh, priority to, to cycling, cyclists and, and pedestrians. And for those rare moments that we do need a car, we'll be um, having lots of car share schemes um, scattered around Frio. Uh, and I should just add, we, we did try a car share scheme in Frio about five years ago and it didn't work because we didn't have the density um, to, yeah, to, to really enable that. It will also be a city based on uh, low carbon and, and renewable energy, um, so co and tri generation. Um, we're going to have innovative ways and low carbon ways of collecting, managing and recycling our waste, con considering we are going to have a lot more people living here. We'll have state of the art green, energy, efficient, uh, energy efficient green buildings, um, which is really combining the old with the new. Uh, and they'll all be um, using systems to collect our precious resources like water and treat them on site and use them. Um, we've already seen the first screen walls going up around Ferro, which is really exciting. So by 2029, we'll be absolute experts in it and we'll be covering our walls. Um, we'll also have a lot of urban agriculture. We've got a lot of roofs and we're going to have many more roofs. Um, so we can be putting, starting to grow food um, and you know, really building that into our urban fabric. Most importantly, though, we're going to, Ferro is going to be a place where many, many more people can live, work and play all right here in, in the one spot. And, and that really helps to... Um, sorry... <coughs> Uh, that really helping to allow everyone to enjoy the, the convenience and the opportunity of what inner city living provides. And, and I can say that because I am, as Brad said, one of the fortunate and privileged few that has the opportunity to live right in the centre. I live in Johnson Court, the, the ugly 70s building across, <laughs> across the road. Um, but it really is a fantastic lifestyle. I've got the train station, you know, four minute walk away. My work is seven minutes. I've got two, two supermarkets on my doorstep. Um, I've got cafes, bars, the markets, all, all the recreation that I need. My gym is just around the corner uh, and the beach, you know, it's all within a 10 minute cycle ride. Uh, it's, so Fremantle already has all the amenities we need to, you know, to facilitate this low carbon lifestyle. And then on top of that, you know, you've got my apartment, which is very small, it's a 60 square metre apartment. Um, it's, it therefore requires very little heating and cooling. Um, oh wait, I should go back. Heat and cooling, it's thermally efficient, um, it's got great natural ventilation and cross flows and everything. Um, and then on my, my backyard, my balcony, you know, I've got my, my food that I'm growing. Um, I've got my biodiversity, so the other side of this, I've got my acacia. Um, I've even got my, uh, my worm farm, so my waste management. And ironically, I probably ha it looks like I have more uh, nature in, in my apartment than Julian does in his house. <laughs> um, so just to, to recap, uh, my vision for for, for Frio in, um, in 2029 is it's a place where lots more people will have the opportunity uh, to live this fantastically convenient, fun, fit and healthy, low carbon lifestyle in a city that's really actively um, encouraging and facilitating, facilitating us to be able to do so. Um, but more than that, in creating these opportunities, Frio has become um, not only a national example of how we can create um, a 21st century city, low carbon resilient city um, that embraces its heritage by combining the old with the new but it's also be going to become a global example that I can write about in my research. 
So my question to you is, um, what, what is your one idea for reducing Freo's carbon footprint to create a more sustainable city? And I should just mention, uh, this is another student, uh, Liam Meritz's um, vision of the port as well. Uh, <laughs> so, thank you. Who will be known to many of you. Griff Longley is an award-winning journalist, a weekly, weekly columnist in the West Australian, a manager is a manager of a program for at-risk kids in Midland called Midnight Basketball and is a CEO of Nature Play WA. Nature Play WA promotes the importance of unstructured play outside and in nature. And it's my pleasure to invite Griff to the stage. Please give me a round of applause. Okay. Look, um, First of all, thanks very much for the opportunity to lend one more perspective into this mix. Uh, someone listening and taking part so far, it's been, it's been wonderful and it's been fantastic to see so many people here. The perspective that I'm bringing to this is simply that of a resident, a long-term resident of Fremantle. Uh, my family moved into the west end of Fremantle in the late 1970s. We lived initially on Cliff Street in the Lilly Building. Cliff Street being the first street in Western Australia, essentially created by the tracks of the supplies dragged from the beach on the south side of the river across to inside the river so they could be ferried up to Perth in the early days of the settlement. A street also that in, when the first blocks were gazetted in this state, one of those blocks was on Cliff Street, which was given to the Sampson family for a trading business. The Sampson family, 180 years later, is still on Cliff Street. They still have a trading business. It's an incredible part of Western Australia and of Fremantle more specifically. For me and my brothers, our experience of growing up in the West End of Fremantle was one of playing in the tunnels and caves underneath the roundhouse, being on the roofs of the West End building, all the buildings. We had ways to get up onto the roofs from almost every street in the West End because we wanted to be able to escape from the dreaded paper boys who worked out of the the news agency on High Street. We never met them, uh, but in our mind, they were a vicious breed that we had to avoid at all costs. <laughs> and I can tell you that when you spend a little bit of time running, literally playing chasey on two or three storey high buildings, you learn very quickly to run on the nail heads. Now you run on the nail heads because underneath the nail heads is timber. <laughs> and on the roofs of our buildings in the West End, I can assure you, some of those roofs really don't stand up to lanky kids sprinting on them. Um, the reason my family moved to Fremantle was in part because interesting buildings were cheap, but more than that, it was because it was a diverse and an eccentric place. Now, this is a time when, when Perth was a very, the suburbs of Perth were dead during the day. There were a shuffle of cars in the morning, and at night, there was just that faint sort of emanating flickering blue of televisions and they smelt like mothballs and stock cubes and you just didn't want to go anywhere near it. <laughs> Fremantle at the same time smelled like drying fish and coffee. It was noisy. There was people from all over the world coming in through the port. There was, you know, you could hear that verbal linguine of the Sicilian accent being spoken on the street. There were Croatians. Aboriginal people, people from all over the world. It was an exciting and, and diverse place. Now, at the same time, it had some issues. It used to be when the sun got down close to the roundhouse, High Street had a sort of shimmer to it, which was the very fine shards of glass that the street sweeper hadn't been able to gather, um, reflecting the sun as it set. One of the games that my brothers and I, particularly my brother Sam, and this is no exaggeration, used to play, we'd play detectives. And we'd do that by following the blood trails from outside the pubs on High Street. There were more pubs than cafes, we know that. Now, while Perth was essentially a dormitory place, a dormitory suburb, Fremantle was a city of short blacks, muscle cars and murals. There were artists living throughout Fremantle. It was a very, you know, it was a wonderful place to be. A lot of that survives, but I'm just going to put it to you as a question, really. Are we heading more into monoculture again? Now, to me, as someone who has kids who are living and growing in Fremantle and who I hope 
will want to stay here and bring up their kids should they choose to have them. What I really hope for this city is that we find a way to recognise and build on that character and that we expand our focus, our heritage focus, from being buildings, which is still hugely, hugely important to protect, but to expand it to include our living cultural heritage. And for me, what that is about, really, it's about vibrancy, it's about diversity, and it's also about our connection to the sea. Now, we are a coastal town. We have a river, we have beaches, we have a port, we have a fishing boat harbour. I would put it to you that our city, if you're walking around our city, you know very little of, the, of that is there. So I suppose my vision for Fremantle boils down to a couple of things. And the first one is that to maintain that diversity and to foster that diversity, I would like to see Fremantle be somewhere that really focuses its thinking, particularly in forums like this, beyond just being about the rate payers, about the letter writers, and about the meeting attendees, as wonderful as it is that we're all here tonight, to focus on our whole community. Because our community is more than just those voices. It's the homeless people in, in Fremantle. It's our retirees and seniors. It's our young people who we need to find things to engage them in this town. It's our Aboriginal people. It's our whole community. How do we engage and bring that out? So I suppose the final sort of to recap really, my vision for Fremantle in 2029 is that being a city that places a formal value on vibrancy and diversity that can be used as a filter in making decisions and in planning. And thank you. Our final question is one that Griff's put together, which is that how do we ensure Fremantle is a vibrant place that welcomes the whole community? Um, James is the facilitator of this whole process, and we're really pleased to have him involved. I'd like to be, take this opportunity to introduce him to you. James will just be saying a few words, but before he does so, um, James is a futurist and a business professional with 25 years experience in leading people and organisations to deliver successful outcomes. In 2012, he was awarded the National Planning Champion by the Planning Institute of Australia. And I've known James for a long time and it's a real pleasure to have him actually in Frio working on what I think is a really exciting process. And please welcome James. Um, it's, what a fantastic opportunity. It's not every day that you get to um, work on something that you're passionate about, which is how do we facilitate conversations in the widest community? And picking up on Griff's point, that we need everybody in this conversation. We need our kids. We need a conversation about where we're going to retire to. We need a conversation about where our kids might be able to afford to live somewhere close to us. I mean, some of you may not want your kids too close, but others of us do. And so the question for me, and this is how I got into this conversation, about how do we take all of the visions that each of you will have in your heads, how do we take all the business community, the Fremantle Port, the Department of Planning, the Department of Water, Energy, Power, you know, it goes on and on. There are so many organisations and groups and stakeholders that have a vision or have documents, you know, they have strategic um, guiding plans that they're working to. But I, what I've found over time is that they've all been in silos. We've got each individual organisation, each stakeholder, each individual, your family, my, na my neighbours' families. We've all got different visions about what this is going to look like and how it will evolve. So what we're looking at doing is bringing all of those together over the next 12 to 18 months. And I'll have the um, pr privilege and the pleasure of working with you in workshops. So this one has, in a sense, been very... Uh, much setting the scene and setting the context, and we've had some very thoughtful and some provoking speakers. The workshops that follow are going to be uh, round tables. You'll be coming and bringing your ideas, and you'll be running um, those conversations. Um, 
It was um, Julian's comment, I think Brad showed the slide, about what is our future and where are we going? Do we actually have a purpose? Do we know where we're going? Now, Alice, I think, sums it up beautifully in that if you, if you don't actually have a plan, well, then in any rabbit hole will do. And it doesn't matter which way you go. But I, what I'm hoping is that um, Vanessa and, um, and Ken and um, Brad and others have actually been explaining to us that doing nothing is not an option. There's a tidal wave of growth and development coming our way. Now, you could, some of us could say, let's just knock a sign on the Fremantle traffic bridge saying, bugger off, we're full. <laughs> and some of us might like to do that. But the, the tsunami wave is coming, and we know that. We know that because of our mining oil and our riches that we have, that the population is growing at about 1,000 people a week. And the question for me is how do we actually accommodate this growth in a, in a sustainable, in a way that doesn't frighten everybody, that we can talk conversations about where do we put the growth, which bits do we keep and we quarantine because they're so fantastic we don't um, do anything with it. So the model that we're going to use is a, a visioning model. It's um, based, some of you might know, the Oregon model of community visioning. And I've copied it um, unashamedly from Stephen Ames. And we, it's a four-step process. It's been working very well in uh, Portland for the last 30 years, where they've actually identified the growth of the city, how do they get the vibrant centre, how do they connect the public transport, how do they get the three levels of government working together, how do they get the community engaged. When they started this process 20 years ago, 15% of the community would turn up people like you in this hall. It's now 35% turn up annually to a summit um, and using the precinct groups, using the PNCs, using the sporting groups, the church groups, all of the networks that you're involved with. I think if you, know, if you were to close your eyes for a moment and think about all of the networks that you're engaged with, whether it's a business one, social and personal networks, and now, of course, we've got um, Twitter and, uh, and Facebook. And so the, the speed of conversation and the speed of communication is, is rapidly increasing. The question is, how do we make sense of it? What sort of future do we want to create? And what could it look like? Now, this is a, a, a target of 20 to 50 years' time that we will get to a point where what we're thinking about today may or may not happen in that time frame. It's going to be evolving. It's a constantly evolving process, so it does need to be flexible. That's actually the third workshop that we're going to be running. The first workshop, which will be on 28th of June, is a conversation about what do we value, what do we love about Fremantle, what are the things that we absolutely have to hang on to in this journey that makes us a unique and special place. The second workshop, which will be in July, will be um, the conversations about what the visions could look like, what are some of the challenges that we might um, face, what are some of the... I'm just going to... Um, get the exact title of the workshop, is um, what are the key issues that we think Fremantle might be facing over the next 20 to 50 years? Essentially, where are we going? Let's have a conversation about what that roadmap that Ken was talking about, what might it look like? And the fourth workshop, which will be in August, um, we'll look at the sort of actions that we need to take to get there. So these are individual plans. It might be your um, street it might be your neighbourhood, it might be your church group or your sporting club or whatever it is, um, or your precinct groups, talking conversations about the sort of actions that we, each and every one of us, can do. Um, because I don't know if you've noticed, but the supply of magic wands is actually very limited and not everybody has one. The Fremantle Council um, is being tasked. They're, they're the ones given the responsibility of facilitating this conversation. It's under the um, Local Government Act. But they don't have all the answers. They don't have all the money. They don't have the capacity to do that. The people power in this room is actually what's going to make the difference. And so that's what that last um, point will be, is that um, in, a, in a sense there's no such thing as a free lunch. We're all going to have to do a bit of work. And what I'm hoping is that you'll take this message back to your community, to your street, to your precinct group, and you'll be an ambassador. The fact that you're here tonight means you care enough about the future of Fremantle that you want to see a brighter future. You want to see a better place. 
We want more livable um, neighbourhoods. And you need to go out and start saying to everyone, we need to turn up to these workshops and to participate because that's the way that we're going to get a genuine and an authentic outcome which will be a brighter place for Fremantle. So just quickly, I know there's a lot of words up there, but we've had the stakeholder briefings about Fremantle, uh, the what, the why, the how, the when, so a bit about the process. Uh, we have the, the launch today, that's the second one there, the visioning program launch. Uh, the four workshops are up there. We're looking at having a community summit in February. So each of the precinct groups, um, churches, sporting clubs, um, PNCs, have I missed any of the sort of um, the men's shed, the CWA? Anyone that is interested um, will come and present their action plan. And then the, the idea is that each and every year, so those because at the moment, each of the precinct groups are beavering away. They're doing fantastic work. But do you all know what they're doing? How do they share that conversation with you? This visioning process will be the mechanism to do it. So um, that's one of my key points, is please tell your family and friends and neighbours and work colleagues about the visioning. Um, invite your network to the um, following workshops. Um, just a quick... Um, bits of housekeeping. We're also looking at um, ho hosting future speakers. So I don't know about you, but I really, it was fascinating listening to Ken and some of the history. I mean, the, the point that we had our first planning minister in 1955 and the vision they had, I didn't know that. Um, I'm probably young enough that I didn't hear those stories, but we need to be able to share that with our community. So we're looking at in, um, Carmen Lawrence's accept an invitation, Geoffrey London, uh, Stuart Hicks, uh, Peter Newman, there'll be other people that, like we've had today with um, Vanessa Griffin, Julian and Ken, will come and just have an information and ed education session. And then a couple of weeks later, we'll have the workshop. So at least we can be a little bit more informed about what some of these challenges are and what some of the opportunities might be. Uh, the next thing is, uh, this is very much a digital um, conversation. I'm sorry. So Linda's filming tonight, and if any of you have any um, burning desire to go and have her poke her camera in your face, uh, tonight's an opportunity, but Linda will be at each and every one of these major workshops. So if you think about something or you think it's a good idea and you want to get something to, to camera that we'll post up on Vimeo and um, YouTube, here's your opportunity to have your say. So you, when no one's editing your comments or your thoughts, they will go straight to camera. Uh, and the other thing is that the questions that you've all been um, very diligently filling in, um, I will be collecting them and um, basically, I hope I can read your handwriting, I will be faithfully recording that word for word and putting them up on the web and the Facebook pages. So there's lots and lots of ways to get involved. People that didn't, weren't able to make it tonight, they can get on the website and have a look at the video. All the slides will be up on the website. So if you wanted to go home and do a, a little do-it-yourself kit where you, you're now the ambassador and you're now the champion, you could go and host a little meeting in your street about what we're talking tonight because it is that important that we keep the conversation going. So um, that's really all I needed to say about the process. So um, thank you very much for inviting me to facilitate these workshops. Okay, we're done. Now, there is an opportunity for some Q&A, but I realise we, we are slightly over time. Are there any burning questions in relation to the process or why you're here that you would like to ask either James, Graham or myself? If not, I thought... We actually, it's, it's been nice to see. We've, we've, we've kicked off the, the Twitter feeds and it's um, great to see so many of you already using those. I thought I might just... Um, there was a, a great, just, I'm going to pick some random comments. It's a bit dangerous, isn't it? So Colin Beatty said, uh, this is about an excellent demonstration of what de good density could look like. And Matt Bowden said, hallelujah, density need not be the en en enemy of, of, of heritage. Um, Annie Matten, reducing carbon, how? 
everything that Vanessa Rowland said. <laughs> so, so, there we are. So, look, and there's, I must say, there's dozens and dozens of comments here. Make sure you use the Twitter feed. It, it's a really great way of actually starting that conversation amongst us all when we all can't be in the same room. All right, are, are, there, any, are there any questions? Yes, Paul. We have a roving mic. Uh, Paul Poulet. Um, one of the things that I've noticed about Fremantle is uh, there's been a, a, a lot of um, pulling down of heritage buildings. So certainly we've, we've got a good number that are preserved. But I look around and I see a lot of quite ugly buildings that have been put up. And it occurred to me that at the time, some people somewhere probably thought that those were a really good idea. Might have even thought that they were really beautiful and hip. And I'm curious about how this process is going to account for the change in trends and fashions in buildings. Uh, Paul, just like you'd ask the really big question at the end of the night, <laughs> how to create the heritage of the future. I reckon you want to have a stab. I mean, I, I can answer that in a really boring way, but James might be more interesting. I think in, um, in the visioning um, programs that I've run um, in other um, parts of WA and the, um, the conversations I have with Stephen Ames in Portland is that what it does is it creates a sense of us together. What is it that we're for? What do we love about our place? Now, if we can articulate that in really clever ways, the developers and the architects and the designers will soon, they'll find that there's an opportunity in it for them. If they are designing buildings that the community love, that's where things will be heading. I mean, I'm, you can never design out bad taste, and you, you, in a, in a, also the council doesn't have control over um, the architecture in the sense of we like that, but we don't like that style. They have to operate within the town planning scheme. So some things will slip through, but if a community is, is united on what it loves and what it wants and what it's for, anything's possible. Thanks, James. Are there any others? Barry, so I couldn't quite see you there in the, in the bright light. Uh, look, I've been really pleased with what I've heard tonight, which has been really, really interesting. But I actually live in, you know, um, up over the, the, the hill in one of the uh, more suburban areas. How are you going to stitch the CBD in with the areas where we live, out, you know, Hilton, Sampson, um, the place where I live in Holland Street, especially... Yeah, with the, um, the trucks going to and from the port, which are actually going to physically cut us off from yeah. uh, the CBD. And I think that's a question, obviously, we can't answer tonight. But can I, can I just comment on that by saying that's one of those key long-term visioning questions. Interesting, Ken actually spoke about, about the Stephenson Hepburn plan, which actually probably designed in those roads that you're talking about now more than 50 years ago, 60 years ago. We actually need to, as part of this, actually start to plan how can we actually create a community that's not divided by those kinds of infrastructure. What is that infrastructure of the future that actually can work? So I guess that's, I'm going to throw it back out as a question to say and that's actually what we need to be doing and that's partly why we're here. Yeah. So, um, i just respond to that as well as say um, this process was set up specifically around those questions because, you know, for the last three years the city has had a pretty clear vision about what it wanted and how it needed to reactivate the CBD of Fremantle, but it, but it didn't have the time to consider more deeply those um, more suburban local community issues. This process is about engaging those local communities and actually having your input into how that's resolved. Um, when it, we don't have all the answers, but, but it's our clear aim here is to engage the whole community of Fremantle, and that's the broader city of Fremantle, um, to answer some of those questions and provide, a, provide that footprint for the future. All right, if there's nothing else burning, I'm going to wrap it up in the... One more. One more? Sorry, okay, very last one. Sorry, I couldn't quite see you down there. Um, Shani. With all due respect to everyone here, we're a very white, middle-class audience. Um, and I suppose I'm interested in how we include people in the process and the conversation who don't come to meetings like this. Absolutely, um, and that's why people like Griff have been invited to pose that question. Um, what, what is it about um, the diversity and how inclusive are we as a community? Um, the sort of, um, you know, my wife and kids are at home. I'm sure they she would have loved to have come tonight to be part of the conversation. So there's many, many reasons why people can't get to forums like this. 
And that's why up on the screen you see um, a very heavy emphasis on the digital media. This is probably one of the first projects in Perth where we will have it integrated between Facebook, the web, Linda's videoing all of these conversations. So if you're not able to make it tonight or you're not able to make it on the 28th of June, you'll be able to get online and still have a meaningful say. What we're hoping through that process is it will, will actually generate people's enthusiasm and you know, get them curious about having a conversation with their neighbours or maybe having... Um, we, I mean, I have, I have a vision that maybe we'll have a, a street champion, um, somebody who could act as a link and a networker for all of the people in the street to say, you know, there's something really interesting happening on the 28th of June, you, we really ought to be there. Now, we do need you to RSVP because, um, as you can see tonight, we actually had to shut the doors um, for fire regulations. This place is licensed to 260 people. So we did turn some people away. We need to know what sort of size of group we're dealing with, um, whether we move it out to the Esplanade under tents or we go to the, free, the ferry terminal or whether we go somewhere else. It's really important that when you're talking to people about coming to these workshops that you um, register online. So, um, well, the problem, the town hall is certainly an option, but um, in the middle of July it's going to be pretty cold and um, it's also a bit impersonal. We wanted to try and find spaces that are more, you know, uh, you know more in, in, um, conducive to having a good conversation. I mean, just personally, um, I think every time I've been to the town hall it's usually um, to tell the council what we're against. And so we're, we're trying to avoid that as a venue because we want to try and change the mindset that this is actually a conversation about what we're for. <laughs> All right. Thank you, James, on that very positive note about imagining a positive future. Thank you. I want to end just by saying thank you to each of you for giving up your night and coming along and being part of this conversation. It is really important and we really do appreciate it. It's been great to see such a good turnout. And we look forward to seeing you at future events. And thanks to each of our speakers. Please give them a final round of applause and enjoy your evening. <laughs>